Well, thanks so much, George. It's, um, it's interesting that even sitting next door to me for six months, Thank I you. still haven't been able to begin to explain blockchain technology to George, but we're going to do our best um, to explain blockchain technology to all of you um, and why it truly has the power to transform virtually everything we do, but especially has a big influence in the impact world. So I'd like to welcome our panelists to the stage, and I really, I've been telling anybody who had listened to me that this is a great panel. Um, these are true experts in the space, and um, I'm so excited to have them here. So we have Mark, who is um, the, a professor at Brooklyn Law School, and to just give you an idea of how professory he is, um, he sent us a note at 10 o'clock last night telling, about, telling us about this um, SEC Enforcement Division annual report, which had lots of information on blockchain and tokenization and um, initial coin offerings that he really wanted to tell us about at 10 o'clock last night. So Mark, <laughs> um, next we have um, Amit, who is the president of the Silicon Valley Blockchain Society. And for anyone that knows the blockchain space, Silicon Valley Blockchain Society is the place you want to be because the members of that organization have in the trillions of dollars to invest. And he'll tell you more about that. And finally, we have uh, Eugene Yun, who's joining us all the way from Korea. Um, and he's the CEO of Simverse and, uh, and one of the founders of Simverse. And he um, and Simverse are developing the next generation of blockchain technology. And he'll talk to us about that. So Eugene. Um, so I'd like to um, tell you why I'm up here. Anyone that knows me knows that I am not a tech person, but I understand the application of technology to things that will make the world a better place. And that's how I got involved in blockchain. My nephew, who's in his early 20s, um, was at Brooklyn Law School, along with Mark and various others, and he came to me and said, what do you know about blockchain? And I said, well, I know it's new technology, I know it's really exciting, and I know it's going to change the world. And he said, well, I'm working with these people um, at this Relate ID Foundation, he said they really need some guidance on how to organize things and how to talk about them. So I said, okay, well, let me listen and I can really, I think, help a little bit. Um, and what I discovered is that Relate ID Foundation is building a self-sovereign identity blockchain. And that self-sovereign identity blockchain um, is a consolidated, secure, scalable, trust-based identity network. Well, all of those words don't mean a whole lot, but to me it meant um, in, uh, personal freedom, economic empowerment, and equal opportunity for all. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to give you a little bit of background information on blockchain technology and what it is, because I know that there are a lot of people in this audience that really have never looked at this, but we're going to talk to you about how blockchain technology can be used to change the world for the better. So we're going to start, um, and you, everyone can sit down, and, and if you'd like to stand while you're talking, you're more than welcome to. Um, we're going to start with Mark, because Mark is a professor, so he's used to teaching people things. Um, and he's actually been phenomenal at teaching me and various others about blockchain technology. So we're going to start with asking Mark, what is blockchain technology? Why should this audience care about blockchain technology? What's the difference between blockchain technology and cryptocurrency like Bitcoin and tokenization and ICOs and all of the things you keep reading about? So, Mark, I'll turn over to you. Sure. Um, so, the idea behind blockchain came about in an interesting way. There was a 
posited question called the Byzantine general's problem. And the idea was if you have five different armies that need to act in concert either to attack a city or retreat, how could you ensure that you're able to get a message across to everybody and build consensus? Uh, you couldn't really send a messenger because he could get caught. Uh, you could have dialogue between the generals, but one may not be loyal. So the question is, how do you build consensus between disparate parties who may not know each other? The idea behind blockchain is to solve for this Byzantine general's problem. If you were to have, for instance, a, uh, a car accident where maybe three people driving a car hit a pedestrian, they could easily collude and have a story where it's three against one. And you could, uh, even if you had a couple witnesses, the majority could kind of take over the witnesses and get them to say their side of the story. If you were somehow able to have that accident occur in a place like Times Square, you would have thousands of witnesses and it would be much, much, much more difficult to capture the majority of that group in order to build a consensus. And that's what blockchain does. It allows you to transact and alert everybody involved in this chain of events of the transaction so that person A is transferring something to person B and everybody on this whole chain is called a node and each node says, okay, person A gives this thing to person B, everybody, we're good, we're good, we're good, okay, and then that's history. So it's this distributed, decentralized ledger that has very, very, very powerful applications. So that's the idea behind blockchain itself. So um, maybe we can go on to how does that differ from cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and you know, sure. wh what's the difference? Well, everybody remembers the World Wide Web. All right? The web browser was something that made it accessible to all of us. But it existed before Netscape Navigator. But it was only being used by a few people. So the idea is that blockchain is this technology kind of like the World Wide Web. And Bitcoin was the first attempt at kind of a Bitcoin web browser sort of a thing. What is the major use case for this technology? And a bunch of people thought, well, right now we need to rely on banks to determine what the financial terms are. If I give somebody money or send somebody money, I need to assume that my bank is properly recording that and that the receiving bank is properly recording that. And if I have a dispute with them, there isn't really a way for me to verify this. Well, what if we had a system by which we didn't need banks and we could just transfer things between each other? And everybody who's participating in this would see that I'm transferring something to Teresa. And then everyone would reflect that Mark transferred something to Teresa. And then as a result, this is the ledger that we live with. So that is what Bitcoin does, is it has this kind of digital asset sort of a thing that is finite. And whenever someone transfers it to somebody else, everybody recognizes that this transfer takes place. And finally, tokenization and initial co coin offerings, and are they securities or not? Well, this is a really, this is a really big topic. <laughs> Um, part of the idea is that, that Bitcoin is kind of this, this open chain where anybody can participate. But let's say that I was trying to issue some sort of, we'll call it a token, whereby I could give a certain number of people access to these tokens and I would transact it on a private blockchain such that only the people that I allow could participate in it. That way I could easily manage these identifiers, these, 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 these markers that can represent something. And so one of the questions when it comes to whether or not tokens are securities has to do with a Supreme Court case called Howey. The lawyers in the room are going to recognize the Howey test, which kind of has four principles, which we, I think we can probably get into later. But the idea is that in a lot of ways, depending on how a token is used, it can be very, 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 very similar to what security looks like. And it's right now unclear how the courts will rule on this. So there's a lot of insecurity in this kind of arena because we're not really sure how the SEC is going to treat these things, or how the courts are going to treat these things. Excellent. Uh, why don't we move on to um, Amit, and if you could just talk a little bit about the Silicon Valley Block Blockchain Society, which, you know, to me is the center of the blockchain universe, um, and how you assess um, all of those blockchain companies that might want to come and present there, and also some of the things that you're doing in the impact space to drive that into those organizations. Sure, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So, um, you know, I, I think oftentimes what happens in, in conversations like this is that there is this feeling that there's this thing called the blockchain or there's this thing called AI, and we are so distanced and divorced from it where we start panicking, right? And the first thing that I'll say to you is, it's probably fair to assume that many of you, and maybe we can have a quick show of hands, 
don't fully necessarily understand what's happening in the blockchain space and haven't applied it to, to their businesses yet, <laughs> right? I mean, that's fair to assume. Um, my first message is don't panic, right? We are in the infancy of this industry. Um, and we oftentimes forget how early we are in this space because of the, the hype cycle that it has come with. And if Bitcoin had not gone from a few dollars worth when no one was paying attention to its peak at 19,000, yeah. no one would have paid attention to this overall industry. And so in that context, that hype cycle was a very good thing to happen because it brought attention to the blockchain. And as Mark explained about the fundamentals of blockchain, to me, there's actually three really interesting pieces to thinking about the whole blockchain ecosystem. So one is, of course, the underlying technology. And that wasn't the birth of this ecosystem. What this really came out of was, was uh, developers in authoritarian regimes who were trying to fight this centralized control or, or massively devaluing currencies, yeah. right? And so the philosophy was, how do we fight centralization? And that gave birth to this whole entire ecosystem, right? On top of that, we have the power of the currency, and Mark explained that really well, and then you have the power of tokenization. And tokenization is not just, oh, we have a currency on top of the blockchain, but tokenization allows us to unlock business models that non-programmable money wasn't able to allow us to do earlier. And from an in investor perspective, um, you know, when you think about being able to provide fractional ownership that can be managed programmatically to underlying assets for people who aren't only accredited investors is an incredibly powerful place for us to be as, as a humanity. So to your question of Silicon Valley Blockchain Society, we created this organization to focus on what this future will look like. The mission of the, of the organization is to fund the revolution. And the revolution is not just a financial revolution. The revolution is one that affects all parts of society, least of all, impact. Yes. And so we brought together, the DNA of the organization is largely um, institutional capital. Um, David Ellington, who is uh, a founder in, in Silicon Valley Blockchain Society, uh, was the chairman of the San Francisco Pension Fund. Uh, David Kushner, who is our chief investment officer, was the chief investment officer of La Serra. Um, so he was managing about $50 billion. Um, and what we wanted to do was we wanted to make sure that it wasn't just this rush for quick money, yeah. which is where the ICOs come in. And to me, the ICO, the initial coin offering, which I think everyone probably has heard of in the, in the, in the news, probably in a negative context, did itself in by calling it an ICO. Yes. It's more like a crypto starter, right? <laughs> it's Kickstarter for crypto than it is, you know, like an IPO yes. for, for crypto. And we often end up losing the battle because we choose long narratives. And so we created this organization to, to essentially bring together early investors in this space, large family offices, large institutional investors who can um, come and participate in the journey because none of you here are going to leave this room going, you know what, we're gonna write $5 billion checks into this new decentralized ecosystem, <laughs> right? But getting you on this journey, getting you to understand immersively is the key to, to being able to allow you to participate in this new asset class. Um, and that is essentially what SVBS does. Our focus on impact is something that, you know, I've been very focused on yes. and we, we made sure that we used a little bit of a Trojan horse approach. We started showing uh, a lot of mainstream capital, incredible companies that are doing incredible things for society without calling them out to be impact companies. And people individually start getting really dialed in and invested. And then soon they start making investment theses around it. And now we have impact as a core part of SVBS. We have chapters around the, around the world and we're just uh, launching a chapter in Oslo, which is our Nordic uh, chapter, which is focused, it's a global impact chapter. So it's just to so be exciting. able to fund mm -hmm. impact companies. So that's excellent, and we'll talk about some of those impact ventures 
um, in a little while. But I'd like to turn to Eugene, and um, he has been talking to us um, at Relate ID. He is creating, he and his team are creating the next generation of blockchain technology. And, you know, you're probably sitting there wondering, wow, I don't even know about the first generation, and here we are in the next generation already. But there's a real need for that for a number of reasons that Eugene will touch on. So I'd like to turn to Eugene and talk to us about you know, where we are today and where Simverse will take us. Sure, thank you very much for that. Amit talked about a revolution, and uh, I think it's ongoing, but it's a quiet one because most of us here have heard about blockchain, but I'd like another show of hands. How many people have actually used a blockchain? Wow, this is a lot more than I expected, okay? <laughs> but I think maybe four or five, yeah? Not bad, not bad. <laughs> there is a real problem. Blockchain, as it is today, has some real flaws and real difficulties, and in my mind, I classify them into two, class, in, into two types. The first type is technical. Technically, it is too slow. So you can't use it for most of, you know, to do tra easy transactions. It is not scalable, so when many people try to use the blockchain, then it gets clunky and it stops and it doesn't work. Fees go up too much. Also, it is damn difficult to use. If you're not a programmer, you're not going to be able to use this very easily. She had a very difficult time onboarding and gave up after an hour. Okay. This is not the way to start a revolution, I don't think. Okay. <laughs> also, from the socio-economic point of view, it has some real problems. There are too much wasteful activities. When this person called Satoshi Nakamoto, and we don't really know who he is. She. She, sorry. <laughs> I think the Japanese think it's a guy, okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so Satoshi came up with this brilliant invention, but he put in there a, a um, way of building consensus agreement that is much, much too slow and too powerful. And as a result, we're using tons of resources, computing power, which equates to more energy, and it's, it's part of the glo global warming process, I'm sure, it is damaging the workings of blockchain as it is. It's way too wasteful. It's also a winner-takes-all kind of game, so that if you build a block, then that person who built the block gains all the rewards from doing so. By doing that, we skew things so that the rich get richer and the poorer get poorer. That's a horrible economy. If you look at the Gini index, and if you're an economist, you know that that tells you what the uh, distribution of income or wealth is. It is much, much worse than the worst country you can think of. So when they said decentralization, I think they're pulling something on us. Okay? This is the point that I come in, and as an economist, we said, hey, we got to change things around if we're going to make blockchain more useful and make it easier for everyone to deal with. So we have introduced at Simverse, our project, we have introduced a number of uh, new technologies and new thinking and new philosophy, which we think will make, it, will make the blockchain much faster, much easier to use, and also be much more uh, uh, fairer to everyone so that if you participate in this universe of ours, then you will be rewarded for all the little things that you do, such as switching on your computer into the system. Okay? So it's not a winner-takes-all. It's a, a reward system that helps everyone uh, uh, do better uh, and, and, and helps everyone to help the integrity of the network. So that's the direction that we're coming from. And we believe that uh, the uh, blockchain should be built in such a way that all the applications that come on top of it should talk to each other so that we have a, 
a scalable universe of blockchains and blockchain users. This is not happening in the current world, and that's the, uh, that's the better world that Simverse hopes to achieve. Excellent. And uh, we were talking about this earlier, but to give you an idea of how energy intensive this is, um, I was corrected because I said Iceland, but it's actually Ireland. So blockchain um, or bit Bitcoin, Bitcoin. Bitcoin yeah. users use as much energy as, the, as Ireland. And they're, build, they're currently building the capacity to mine Bitcoin in Iceland because of the cheap power there. So I got them backwards, but you, you, you get it. I mean, this is a very, very energy intensive process. And the technology that Simverse is developing is um, designed to reduce that energy intensiveness and also to um, reduce the time it takes to um, reach a consensus. Mark? Yeah, if I could just build on, on, on what Eugene said earlier. As I mentioned before, on the current blockchain, a lot of the current blockchain implementations, when you transact, you transact to everybody who's participating, which means that if you have 10 people, that's not that many people, right? The majority is six, six is consensus. Um, I could take that over by adding 11 people to the network. All of a sudden, what is 10 becomes 21, 11 is the majority, that takes over and can rewrite history. So the more participants you get, the more secure it becomes. But if you get tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of participants, every transaction requires tremendous amounts of energy distributed across all of these participants. And the time it takes, because we're not just having one transaction per day or one transaction per week, we're having plenty of transactions every day, such that there can be a backlog. You can have plenty of transactions a second, depending on which platform you're using. So the idea is that the more people that participate, the more secure it becomes, but then the more costly it becomes to continue to use. That's what we hear about problems with scalability. That's why we hear about problems with energy consumption. That's why we hear about problems with time between transactions. And these are all things that need to be addressed in order for blockchain to continue to be this transformative technology. Absolutely. Um, so I think what I'd like to do now is have each of you talk about um, the impact or sustainability issues that you feel blockchain is suited for um, and you know, get the audience thinking about things that they can relate blockchain mm -hmm. technology to. So well, I don't know who wants to... I, I can kick off. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, my background's law and policy, so when I think about these things, I think of law and policy issues. So anytime you have a, a limited resource, so property title, for instance, there are some counties in Illinois that are putting property title on a blockchain. You wouldn't need title insurance, you wouldn't need to have title researchers to, or title search to, to before you buy a real property. You would just be able to look on the chain and see, oh, this is the last owner of record, and contact them, and when you do the transaction, it'll be reflected in the chain, and then there's no question over ownership. Uh, art provenance, for instance, could be something that could be done. I mean, the, these are kind of the low-hanging fruit applications to me. Uh, to my mind when it comes to the use of blockchain. Uh, proxy voting, yeah. to see who's controlling a proxy vote at a certain time is another kind of thing that can be, I think, managed very well on the blockchain because you have this decentralized distributed ledger and there's accountability on it because you can see what the transactions are and you can see exactly when those transactions took place. So I would, uh, I would add to those, I think, low-hanging fruit, right, in terms of examples. Identity is a really good yes. example that you started with. Um, you know, I'll give you a, an example of that with um, the Norwegian Refugee Council, yep. uh, one of the world's largest refugee agencies dealing with 4.5 million refugees uh, in the Syrian crisis now. Um, and sitting with their secretary general, um, the, the question he asked was, guess what our biggest need is in, in these camps? And hint, the answer had nothing to do with any of Maslow's hierarchical needs, right? There was no food, clothing, shelter. They're, they're well-funded, they're, they're okay. It was identity. These Syrian refugees are coming in with nothing on them. And even if they had a document, you wouldn't care because it's a state you don't recognize anymore. And so they're starting from zero. They have no identity. And if they get to, you know, I always use the example of a, a heart surgeon in Homs in Syria who somehow made it alive to the camp with his four family members, got even luckier and, and got asylum to Canada um, and ends up as part of this program at the Vancouver General Store, right? 
where he should have actually been at the Vancouver General Hospital. 400 surgeries under his belt, all these qualifications, there's no way to prove it. And, and from an impact perspective, yes. identity is just massive there, right? But there's another way to think of this. I mean, we can draw out many use cases for impact, and you know, obviously we work with a whole bunch of them. But when you think about the impact of being able to get mainstream population involved in the kind of projects that are being funded today only by you know, wealthy family offices or accredited investors, right? You can democratize and decentralize that process because the ability to create these smart contracts and the tokens that are driven by them means that you can have hundreds of thousands of people participate in projects where they believe their values lie, right? Where we, we talked about this, the, there's this amazing conscious awakening happening around the world, certainly in the, in, in the Western world, where we are starting to drive our influence and our, our money towards the, the values that are important to us, whether it's you know, the environment or women's rights or what have you. And this is true of people outside this room as well, <laughs> right? And they should be able to participate in, in what they believe in. And this is the power of tokenization and bringing those models to impact, I think will stop being a category of blockchain, but it'll be the primary focus of blockchain. Yeah, and one other um, application for something like self-sovereign identity is um, things like human trafficking. Because if you have an identity in your home country that belongs only to you, and all of your records are associated with that identity, then if you are you know, captured or um, you know, brought to another place against your will, you can bring back that identity. And there are people that are currently working on this application, which you know, is just extraordinary, because there's really not other technology that allows you to do this and allows you to own that identity. Eugene? Um. I'm going to stick my neck out here. <laughs> Earlier, Teresa asked, what can't blockchain be used for <laughs> or shouldn't be used for? And I couldn't think of a single thing. Okay? And let me explain what I'm talking about. Blockchain is like an infrastructure, an infrastructure like internet. You can use the internet for a lot of things directly, but also it's used indirectly everywhere. We're using internet for all sorts of things, and my belief is that the blockchain will come overlay with the internet, and if there are records to keep, and all of us need to keep some record or another, then the blockchain will be used. Okay? Because it's easier, it's faster, it's more accessible, it's, it's, it, it's more transparent, more disclosure, more involvement. It's better in most respects. It's a new technology. Just as we accepted internet into our lives, I think the blockchain will come into your lives as well. Okay. And the other, the other thing I would add to that is that it's secure. Um, you know, what, you. One of the things that you know, we're most concerned about is that Alexa can hear everything we, can, we say in our house. Well, if you store personal information on a blockchain, unless somebody knows your key code, they're not going to be able to get at that personal information. So the security of blockchain technology really sets it apart from the things that we're using right now. So I, I, I'll actually uh, <laughs> play contrarian here in spite of, uh, of uh, being Silicon Valley blockchain society. Um, I think that, that we shouldn't get into the weeds of, you know, blockchain will be applicable for everything. I almost think that's not important. I think we need to understand the power of what decentralization brings to a whole host of, of social and business models. And the beauty of the blockchain is when it becomes ambiguous. Right? So, for example, 2017 was all about we 
we saw founders, first time founders building this cool new blockchain technology. My blockchain is faster, my blockchain is safer, my blockchain can't be hacked, my blockchain has you know, 15 other characteristics, right? 2018 has been largely about experienced founders trying to solve business problems using decentralization. By 2020, we'll get to a point where I get why we need to have these conversations today because everyone needs to understand what the blockchain is about and what power it, it, it has and what problems it can help solve. But you don't care about what protocol your browser is <laughs> using to show you information on the blockchain, right? Or on, on what's happening with your favorite sports team. You don't know what web server or what storage is being used in the background. We have been abstracted from that level. And we'll get to a point where there will be companies that use the power of decentralization. They use the power of cryptocurrencies, of tokens, of security, all of these things that are powered by the blockchain. But if, if two years from now we need to sit and have this conversation, then as an ecosystem we've done something wrong. Yeah. Agreed. 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 So um, why don't we uh, talk a little bit about the, the legal aspects of blockchain oh technology and, and maybe just use one of the examples that you were giving us from the paper that you read last night. Sure. Um, so we often hear of blockchain as it's related to cryptocurrencies. And we often hear in the news about cryptocurrencies that are fraudulent, uh, initial coin offerings that are fraudulent, and a lot of people view blockchain technology as inextricably linked to cryptocurrencies, and cryptocurrencies inextricably linked to things like the Silk Road or you know buying illegal things on the internet. Um, as with any industry, you are going to have people that capitalize on confusion with new technology to perpetrate regular fraud. Uh, most of the SEC actions against people in the uh, initial coin offering space had nothing to do with the fact that these were initial coin offerings. They had to do with the fact that people were selling something um, for money and not giving the people who gave them money the thing that they were selling. It was just a regular, regular fraud. <laughs> it, you know, it, it may have seemed fancy because it said blockchain, it may have seemed fancy because it said token, but, but it was just a fraud. So I think that um, there's a lot of negativity around cryptocurrencies, around blockchain, because of these bad actors. But I don't think that's reflective of the industry as a whole. Now, certainly, you're going to have people who have ideas that just don't really work. And they're honest and sincere, but their business models just aren't what they should be. But those aren't in the same category as people who are defrauding investors by selling them things that don't exist. Can Eugene? I, yeah. yeah. Um, with all these cryptocurrencies out there, I think one has to be very, very careful about buying any kind of tokens, with all due respect. Okay? Because we're at a very early stage, and we must realize that most of these projects will fail. They will fail for many reasons, because <coughs> they're crooks, because they ran out of money, because their ideas were bad in the first place. But we need to check very, very carefully what we're looking at. Those of you who were with the dot-com boom in the late, late 90s, you know what I'm talking about. They had wonderful ideas. Some of, it, some of them had brilliant, brilliant technologies, but they were too early. How many survived? Not many. Same thing will happen with cryptocurrencies. Probably even worse, because the cryptocurrency is going at a faster pace. Okay? So we're not here to advocate that you buy coins or anything like that, but to understand that there's a big revolution coming, it has to do with an infrastructure called blockchains, and you should try to uh, uh, be a part of that revolution if possible. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting, right? So I, I actually agree with you. I'm, 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 I wouldn't advocate to go out and just buy tokens, right? Mm. Um, and while history doesn't repeat itself, it definitely rhymes, isn't it? <laughs> and, and, you know, you can draw those parallels a lot. I, I'm actually personally a big fan of bubbles. Right, this might be an unpopular thing to say. But bubbles are great because they accelerate inflection points when there's a there, there. You know, as much as we look back on the, the dot-com boom and bust as some sort of crazy negative thing, the truth is the world we live in today 
would not have happened right. Agreed. if the dot-com boom and bust had not right. happened. And like I said earlier, because of that crazy meteoric rise of Bitcoin, the, the underlying technology and the, the models uh, that, that got attention um, from, from a mainstream audience have allowed us to start pursuing the yeah. kind of industry that we're looking at right now. So maybe you could help us understand what types of businesses um, have come to Silicon Valley Blockchain Society that are likely to be viable with under, the underlying technology being blockchain technology. Right, so, so I, I want all the kids to succeed, but like Eugene said, the reality <laughs> is that 90% you know, of the companies I think in this space will fail for the same reasons that Mark, you and oh. Eugene outlined, right? There's, there, there are a bunch of companies that shouldn't be decentralized, that don't need tokens, that could work just fine without the blockchain. Stop trying to put a square peg in a round hole because it's sexy right now, right? Um, and actually in our evaluation, that's what we look at right away. You know, does this, does this company solve a meaningful problem? And I'll take a few seconds to just give you a sense of what we look at, yes. right? Um, so the first thing we're looking at is companies that are going to be foundational to the future of this decentralized ecosystem. Now those could be infrastructure companies, but they don't have to be. Secondly, we look at companies that are bringing centralized category leaders into the decentralized space. So an example of that would be something like Kodak Coin. I'm not sure how many of you have heard of Kodak's blockchain initiative. Awesome, two, or oh, one and a half, actually. Um, but two and a half. Um, so uh, there was, a, there was a, a company that in Berlin that was using AI to be able to do image detection on the web to see if an image that was yours or the Times uh, to go and you know, find if someone had used it. Uh, they combined with a blockchain company that said, oh, well, this needs to be on the blockchain because you can actually then track it, and when it goes in, it's in, you know, it's a... It's a, it's a ledger item. Um, and then they thought, well, but this only matters if you have massive amounts of I image assets. And as it turns out, one of the largest owner of digital image assets is Kodak. They, they missed out on the whole digital revolution. We all know about that. Um, and so they came together and they created this platform called Kodak One. And the Kodak coin is the currency on top of that. So, if you put an image out and it's your copyright, it goes onto this blockchain. If someone wants to use it and copy it on their website, the blockchain won't let them. And if they do, it'll say, you know, you need to pay four Kodak coins or five right. Kodak coins. Um, third, we like companies that uh, say, you know what, we don't care for Kodak. We're going to go and disrupt that centralized category leader. So let's come up with a decentralized, you know, secure version of Uber. You know, why have this one company that holds all the levers of power? Um, and then there's also lots of problems that exist because or in the, de in the centralized world, and you can solve it with decentralization. And identity is a good example yes. of that. Right? We've talked about that already. And then finally for us, um, you know, we're very focused, like I said earlier, on impact. And so yes. we want companies that are focused on making this world better. In the ideal world, that would be every company, <laughs> um, and we're, 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 we're pushing a lot of our founders towards that. Um, I always say my final threshold of writing a check is not just all these other check marks, but it's when I, when I can hear the founder's heart sing. Eugene, do you want to comment on that, on what, what type of use cases you're looking at for the um, platform sim, sim, the platforms Simverse will support. Right, thank you. Well, Simverse is a, a project that is uh, uh, just about to launch. We will have our platform up and running uh, early next year. And one of the interesting things is that we're getting a lot of entrepreneurs come to us about how to design their business so that they can take advantage of the blockchain uh, platform we are building. And uh, the range is really diverse and I think very, very, very impactful. Because of the audience here, let me give you an example. We have a company from Uzbekistan that is doing uh, 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 hydropower, mini hydros, and uh, they want to be able to issue coins 
uh, tokens so that they would show ownership of these uh, uh, hydropower uh, operations. And they can issue the coins to, uh, uh, worldwide to the uh, audience that we have on our sim world. And the idea would be that if you buy these coins, you are actually investing in the uh, renewable uh, energy project there. And you can see exactly the uh, kind of uh, energy that is being produced and how it's being sold and what your stake is. And there is a contract so that you will be paid regularly. Now, normally, as an investor sitting in Colorado or sitting in Seoul, Korea, where I'm from, I have no idea what happens to my money once it goes to Uzbekistan. <laughs> I don't know how much they're producing, what is going on, but here the contract is in place and the investor will know exactly how to do it. And the wonderful thing is you don't have to, the project costs $4 million. You don't have to do one or two or $3 million. You can put in $5. You can really narrow it down to the kind of size you want. And if we have enough of these projects, I can form a portfolio of impact investments that would be very much diversified, but in a way that tells me exactly what is going on with all of my projects. Um, so at this point, I'm going to open for questions, and then each of us will come up with a concluding remark. Now, I am not using the app for questions because I basically can't see my phone if I'm sitting up here. So if everyone would, if anyone who has a question would just go to one of the mics, um, and we do have them set up in the middle of the room in addition to on the sides of the room this time because it'll be easier for you to get there. So um, please go right ahead with your question and introduce yourself first. Hi, I'm Gary Matthews, and I'm um, the managing member of uh, SRI Investing in Manhattan. And my question is, uh, I'm thinking about the SEC interest in all of this and wondering um, if, if I want to participate or use the word invest in one of these impact activities that's on the blockchain, how is the token not a security? And I think that's why the SEC is interested in this and just want to hear comments about that. So, great question. The, when you're investing, uh, when a token represents an underlying project, it's not different from like an ETF, right? It is absolutely a security and that is the position of the SEC. The SEC here in the US has come out and said, um, even with the, with, the, with the Howey test, you know, the, the general position was we haven't seen um, a, a token yet that passes the, the, the Howey test, right? And so it's, it really is a security. So uh, right now, the pros and cons from a US perspective, um, you are investing in a security. Uh, that token has to be registered as a security. One of the most popular things happening in the space now is something called the STO, the security token offering. Um, <laughs> It's a more complicated answer, actually, when you, when you think of a global ecosystem, because there are a lot of uh, functional mechanics of the token that don't lend itself well to being a security, um, because it just might be a utility that you use within the system, mm -hmm. that users might be able to stake some coins to be able yes. to upload some content into the, into the system. And those users may not be accredited. And so it becomes really complicated when you start saying, yes, but if you want to buy those tokens, if you want to invest in them, they need to be registered securities. And of course, you can get into, you know, reggae and reggae plus and, and you know, have certain uh, amounts of non-accredited investors invest as well. A byproduct of that right now till we have proper clarity, right, instead of dealing with what is going to be the directive of the regulator, um, the challenge we have today is that's not the law of the land yet, or we haven't have, we don't have established laws of the land. Malta has done an amazing job with actually passing laws that deal with crowdfunding, raising money, that deal with regulating cryptocurrencies and the blockchain, and regulating the fiduciary service providers, the banks, the exchanges. And so whether you like 
that law and whether it's the ideal one or not, we can debate another time, but at least you know what you're going to expect when you create a token or when you invest in a token or you, are, you operate an exchange. Um, and we're losing innovation because of that. You know, I was can saying I? To, to everyone earlier that 90% of the companies we see are starting to be domiciled outside of the yes. US until they can figure out what they can actually do. I, I think it's really very difficult to figure out because from an accounting standpoint, these tokens that are being issued by most projects, they're not equity and it's not debt. What kind of instrument is it? So they're all acting like a central bank. Okay? And once you get into that realm of things, to call something security or not becomes terribly difficult. So I think just as we're looking at a new technology that's going to change a lot of things, we need our way of thinking about business, about accounting, about taxes, all sorts, all sorts of things need to be reviewed and uh, reassessed in view of, the, of blockchains. And the question of is it a security or not, I think it's too simple and we won't get an answer right away. Mark? Next, Mark, oh, do you want no, to? I, I think that the panel covered it very well. Okay. Next question. So I, I'm, I'm Jim Frazen. I'm from Communitas Financial Planning in Oakland, California. I have three questions. One is, what is the underlying technology? One. Two, what makes it secure? And three, what's going to happen to the black market if this is universally uh, employed? Uh, Mark, Mark would you go, like wait, to take that one? Mark should take one and two, and I, I'll quickly say for three, uh, this is not popular with the black market, safe to say. So what is the underlying technology um, behind blockchain? Uh, it has to do with this idea, and there's layers of encryption, and, uh, and actually my co-panelists can speak more to the technical elements of it. But it's this idea that you have networks in which you have participants who are able to have this consensus approach depending on the way that it's implemented. So technically you could have one that is a 51% consensus. You could even tip it up a little higher. I know that Simverse has an approach <coughs> whereby you have different layers of participation. Can I it. answer the what is the <coughs> technology question in a different way? It's very complicated, and it's not complicated for the reasons you think, okay? It's complicated and complex, I should say, because it uses many things. Bitcoin is essentially a software. Sorry, s blockchain is essentially a software, okay? It uses computer programming. It uses databasing. It uses, it goes beyond that and uses all sorts of ideas from economics, so game theory, voting theory, social choice. It uses ideas from ethics, ideas from politics as well. So it's all meshed together, and what we're doing is creating a peer-to-peer -peer network. It's also a network technology, okay? And it's open source so that everyone can use it. I'm sorry I'm not explaining it in terms of nuts and bolts, but it is a consilience. We bring many, many different ideas from many, many different fields, and that comes together to be the blockchain. And that is why we should not rely on one scientist to determine how blockchain technology will be. We should be bringing together the great minds from uh, uh, cryptography, from sociology, from monetary economics, uh, ethics, philosophy, all of those things uh, uh, come into this melting pot to make a very nice stew. So if I could just add one thing. Um, so as I said, I am not a technical person. And um, when my nephew and I got involved in this, our family was asking us, well, what exactly is this? So the easiest way it was explained to me is that a blockchain allows you to put information in. So that could be, let's use a really simple example, a medical, medical records. So as we all know, every doctor has their own medical records, which means every time you go to a doctor, you have to fill out the same forms for three different doctors. It's, 
you know, it's very inefficient. So you can put those medical records into the blockchain. They're stored on your personal blockchain. So let's say you have your own space in the blockchain. And then they go in, they get sharded up, and then if you want to take those out or allow someone else to see them, they come back together. And that's the most simplistic way of thinking about it. But it's also, um, you can all disagree with me, but to me, that's the easiest way to think about it. So the information gets broken down into so many little pieces, and then it has the ability to be, broke, to be put back together with this key that only you control. Teresa, there was also a question about security by Jim. So just very quickly, people think it's not secure because they lose their wallets or, or keys or things like that uh, on blockchains. Uh, that's true, but also the system itself can be insecure. Uh, we need to be very careful about it. And there's a lot of engineering that goes to make it secure. But what we thought was secure before can be cracked again. So uh, I think the question of security is still a very open, open issue. Um, I don't know how much time we have, but I, I can yeah. ex just extrapolate very quickly on, on that, sure. the technology and the security in a simple way. When a transaction happens on the blockchain, you are anonymized and hashed. There's a hash that represents you, not you as Jim. Um, and then the transaction that happens of that medical data going in has its own encryption. And so now those two things are yes. attached, and that's the way that the system knows that, that this content is in there, but it is not readable to the, to the naked eye or the hacker's naked eyes, essentially. And that's where fundamentally some of that security aspect comes in. Next question, and then we're going to wrap up. Hello, my name is Chase McGill. I am a conference scholar and advisor from B. Riley Wealth Management. Um, my question is, can you briefly shed some light on the Ripple blockchain, um, being that it seems to be the most integrated into the banking and payment prom uh, processing industry, and partic particularly relating to international microfinancing or underbanked population groups? Um, so, Ripple is very interesting, right? So there's two parts to Ripple. One is the, the currency, and two is the technology. And in, in, the, in, the, in the phase where Ripple just went through the roof, uh, Ripple was announcing these banking deals, and the currency was going through the roof, and I think the challenge was that the average person didn't understand that those two things were not connected. <laughs> the Ripple technology wasn't its currency. Um, you were not investing in the company. Um, it's a very interesting point around the question of Ripple because what it really comes down to, and, and, and I think we, we didn't hit on that today, which is the real power of, of what the blockchain has brought is it's allowed for, for transactions to be near zero cost. And that is the foundational principle of Ripple, right? You can transfer money cross-border at near zero cost. And one of the biggest uh, powers of the implementation of blockchain is that you can uh, take away the intermediaries. And so you don't need to, if you need to transfer money from, from one geographic location to another, it can happen on this blockchain at near zero cost. You don't have to go through clearing houses or you know, people who are conver converting currency into, from one fiat to another. And that's why Ripple is ending up becoming a very powerful um, underlying protocol and the technology that the banks are starting to implement globally. Okay. May I? May uh, I actually, we're, we're completely out of time. Okay. And George has admonished me to stay on time. Um, so my last question was going to be, and I'm going to let all of you ask these panelists this question um, after this panel discussion. It was going to be, um, in 30 seconds or less, um, if you look out five years, what do you believe the greatest environmental or social impact of blockchain technology will be? And I think it's a super important question. And again, these guys will be around um, until tomorrow. So if you do have some time to pull them aside and talk to them, I would urge you to do that. So thank you all for your time. I really appreciate it. We all really appreciate it. And thank you, guys.